So I'm going to introduce uh, Sam Rauch, who um, we all talk about uh, sequential roles in this process and different uh, minor major roles. Uh, Sam has played a role in the implementation uh, of SFA, the advice of the committee on the Magnuson Act 2006, and then now finally he's uh, sort of in charge. <laughs> And he can report out on, he actually led the fishery service until recently. Uh, he's still now the deputy, but uh, he's the person everyone talks to and everyone wants to hear from. So thank you, Sam. All right, is that good? I, uh, I'm Sam Rauch. I am the Deputy Director of the National Fisheries Service and uh, before I get into my talk, let me sort of tell you where I fit into this. I am happy to say that I am not old enough to be part of Bud Walsh's story. <laughs> um, I did not, uh, I wasn't even born for some of that stuff. Um, I, when I came up, I, I do enter into Penny Dalton's story because she, she talked about the uh, passage of the SFA in, in 1997 and the increase in litigation was a, uh, I forget what you called it, but something like the Hiring Act for Lawyers or something like that. Well, that was me. <laughs> I, I started in this process at the Justice Department as a trial attorney, uh, and one of the things I did was Magnus Knack cases. And you will recall from Penny's slides, there were a, a, a series of bars in which there was a bunch of purple and a bunch of blue, and the purple was bad and the blue was good. And I was the blue, right? So just based, I was the blue, and um, I'm sure that's the case. Um, but anyway, we, we had a number of troubles. It, it was very difficult. The, the uh, Magnuson uh, litigation was increasing. It was increasing for a lot of reasons. One of them was because there were some very ambitious deadlines, and the agency hadn't quite figured out how to deal with some of those issues. And the issues, as you've heard, were all uh, very entrenched. They weren't susceptible to easy solutions. Even though the tools were there, it took more time than we were allowed to actually get the tools. But without that incentive, we would never have gotten where we did. Um, at the, by the time I left the, the Justice Department in about 2004, I was assistant section chief in charge of all the Magnus Neck litigation. And I'm happy to say we had changed that dynamic from losing half the cases to winning 90% of the cases that we'd gotten under the Magnus Neck. And I came over to the Commerce Department as their chief in-house lawyer and uh, unlike Bud Walsh, who is still a trial attorney, you know, I saw the error of my ways and <laughs> left the legal profession for something higher, better calling. And, um, and so now, I'm, and so I came over to be the deputy director under Bill Hogarth. And that's where I entered Margaret's story is um, we had to craft it. At one point, we did an administration bill. We did several of them. The last one, which uh, fed into that process and was the position the administration was taking in all the negotiations, I was one of the, the two main drafters on that. I was the administration's chief negotiator with Margaret on passing that bill. She didn't do everything I wanted, um, but you know I think we worked together. The administration, unlike uh, what you heard from Bud, where the Ford administration was adamantly opposed and antagonistic, uh, we, we really were trying to work together to, to make this work. We did agree that major changes needed to be made and a lot of the provisions are things that the administration embraced, and this administration embraces. Um, so that's sort of where I fit in, in the history. Um, I was, uh, I am a career employee, but for the, the past uh, two years up until January, I was filling, I was acting in a political position while they uh, found a political uh, to head the agency, and I'm very pleased to say it, everything goes around and comes around. The person that they have, have found to uh, take this in is, and is the new head of the fishery service, Eileen Sobeck, was my very first boss back in, at DOJ. Um, you know, when I was a brand new law student fresh out of law school, she was the one that hired me in that lawyer uh, act um, to do that. So that's who I am. Um, I want to, I'm going to say some general principles about take home messages. These are all have little asterisks. So what I'm going to say is, in general, true. In specifics, probably incorrect, but I, I want to get this big point out there, and then we can talk about uh, some of the specifics. One, the Magnuson Act is a phenomenal success, and it continues to work today, even in New England. And I'll talk about that. But it is, and we'll talk about why. Two, and this one's going to come with a really big asterisk, we have ended overfishing. 
And I'll tell you about the asterisk, so don't quote me completely on that. But we have, and that, that fundamental fact, that was the goal that we have been set out for, this is the quest we have been on for a long time, it is not only an environmental achievement, uh, an ecological achievement, it's an economic achievement. What we are starting to see with our fishermen is they are able to market that now. You as fishermen are able to go to the consumer and to the rest of the world and say, we have a sustainable system here in the US. Buy US products, it can work. Third major point, this is a process, not a point estimate. Fisheries is adaptive management. Fish stocks come and go based on various recruitment uh, patterns. It's much like predicting floods. You don't know exactly how many fish you're going to get in a, in a given year based no matter how good you manage. Um, you cannot sit there and say, this is the biomass level we're trying to achieve. Really what you're trying to achieve is a range. It's a rate. Uh, it's an adaptive process. It takes a lot of energy to monitor that. It takes a lot of science. And that's the fourth and final point which I'll get at is there's a, in order for this to work, it requires a substantial investment and sacrifice. It requires an investment in science, which we have been willing to make. It requires an investment in time. Some of you who are involved in the council process know just how much time this takes. It requires sacrifice on the part of the fishermen. The fishermen have had to forego short-term economic gain. Many times they will get, in the long run, more economic gain, but not always. And despite the fact that the Magnus Act is working nationwide, there are places where it is still very difficult to manage fisheries. There are places where fishermen are still having a lot of difficulties. But they do that. Unlike in some of the past areas, the fishermen do make these sacrifices, and we are on a good sustainable footing. So let me talk a little bit about uh, some of those asterisks that I talked about. Uh, first. Why is the Magnus Act working? And, and let me uh, give you some statistics uh, about that. Uh, these are the only numbers I hopefully I will give because as a, a lawyer, I don't really know how to add. Um, <laughs> last year, or in the past two years, we've seen some of the highest landings on record in US fisheries. The most recent economics shows that the commercial fishermen landed 9.6 billion pounds of seafood. I think that's the second highest ever. Valued at 51 billion in two, 2012, that's also the second highest value ever. Uh, sorry, 5.1 billion. So we have, uh, in terms of the jobs creation, somebody I think Bud mentioned or maybe Penny mentioned, this is a jobs, this is a jobs issue. This is an economic statute. We are succeeding on the commercial fisheries on the economic side by having high landings and high value. Nationally, those are just the landings value. Nationally, we are generating a, more than $199 billion in sales impacts, contributing $89 billion to the gross domestic product, and supporting 1.7 million jobs. That's actually an increase of 200,000 jobs in the midst, that was in 2010, in the midst of one of the most difficult recessions in recent memory. We are adding and supporting jobs in this country through the fisheries. This is an economic success. And we should not lose sight of the fact that all of the 30 or 40 years of history, if you go back to World War II, I don't know how far back you want to go. Um, this is a success. The system does work. Um, now let's talk about the environmental side of it. We have had a, hist a problem in this country with overfishing, with rebuilding. What is the magnitude of that? We manage in federal waters about 538 stocks. 9% of those currently are subject to overfishing. For those of you who are students, that means we just got a 91 and an A minus and we're doing pretty well. Um, but that's, we're not satisfied that. We want to get rid of that. And I'm going to talk in a minute about what that asterisk meant on that. Why is it that we still have, when I said we've ended overfishing, why do we still have 9% subject to overfishing? Um, only 17% of the stocks of those 534 are overfished. 83% are perfectly healthy and are contributing to those economic numbers. And that's the work of all the people in this room and elsewhere in the country to, to get that. We continue to make progress. We continue to take stocks off of the overfish list, to take stocks off of the overfishing list, and to rebuild these stocks. Um, so on the environmental side, we have achieved great economic success. 
We're achieving the goals that Congress set out for a domestic management at the same time that we are achieving sustainability on the environmental side. That's very difficult to do, and there's been some things. Now, let me, let me talk about the asterisk because we've ended over fishing. Um, we were required in the 2007 Act to, by 2010, put in annual catch limits, which is an annual quota, basically, at a level that wouldn't allow overfishing. And with one minor exception, we were three months late, we did that. So the, unlike in the, the 97 amendments, uh, where we missed all our deadlines and lost all those lawsuits, we actually made the deadlines. This was a phenomenal effort, both in part of the administration, but mainly in part of the councils, the, the regional fishery management councils, who had to amend every one of their fishery management plans, 40 some of them, it, which many of them take years to amend, to put this kind of measures in place an annual quota and accountability measures that will, if you go over, because it's a process and not a point, will um, bring you back in line ahead of time. So um, we have put those in place. All of those are designed to ensure that you're not overfishing. We think the measures are in place across the country such that overfishing is not occurring. However, we can't prove that until we do a stock assessment that validates that. So they're still on the overfishing list until the science comes back and says that the management worked. That's why you've got 9% that are still subject to overfishing. In addition, some of the other asterisks around that, um, I only manage federal fisheries. I don't manage fisheries in state waters. Uh, some states manage fisheries very, very well. Alaska does a great program. Um, but we, those statistics don't include state waters. Also, it doesn't include international. Many of those stocks that we manage are international stocks. I think Margaret mentioned uh, turtle catches internationally. We are seeing that. Where we have an international fishery, we may do a great job in this country, um, but we can't control the international overfishing, and we still keep track of that. So some of those stocks that are in that 9% are international. But that's why I say we've ended overfishing in this country. We put in the process to make sure on the management side, that we're managing at a level below the overfishing levels and that we will react if it happens. And it could, in any instance, happen. I want to talk in a minute about my friends in New England, which I think have, have gotten somewhat of a bad rap, but maybe not completely, uh, through the prior speakers. Um, uh, in, in a minute about that. But, um, you know, in any given time, you could look at the stock assessment and see, well, there are not as many fish as you thought there would be. Or you had, you had predicted the fish based on a cycle of recruitment where you have a large year class every six years. And maybe this time the year class, that year, year, year class is delayed. It's not coming, but it comes in year nine. Well, we might be overfishing then. Um, and it's not because of the fishermen's at fault. It's not because the managers at fault. It's just, you know, that's the way natural systems work. You have to be able to adapt to that. And that's what we put in place now so that we are uh, fishing below that level. Um, let me, uh, let me pick up the story before I talk about um, the investments parts you need to make. Let me pick up the story from 2007 a little bit. 2007 had a whole slew of requirements in there. The one thing Congress did for us that um, uh, hadn't happened before is they were very mindful of the pace at which the agency could actually implement that. So we had, as I said, what I think is the most important requirement in 2007 the requirement to put in these annual measures such that overfishing will not occur. Um, Congress allowed us to phase that in until 2010 and essentially let the council process pick that up. And so we were able to meet that deadline. And largely, um, we've avoided that huge slew of litigation. We continue, our litigation trends are continuing. We have about 100 cases a year in any given issues. Uh, we've created a, a litigation culture and are well employing Bud Walsh. Uh, but, um, you know, we, we are generally successful. Those issues are not these large-scale issues we were losing in the end of the 90s. They're really fact-specific issues, and we do fairly well on that. Um, but that continues. Um, we are implementing that. We've ended these overfishing. We've done a number of other things, uh, which we have some other uh, fishery service speakers that are going to talk about in more details. But largely, we did the most significant thing which was put those annual catch limits in, in place. We also did the second most significant thing, which was a small provision of the bill which required the councils to manage below 
the overfishing recommendations set by their science and statistical committees. Not every council actually had a science and statistical committee at the time. They all do now, and they all set their management measures below that level. It's something so obvious you would think would have been a requirement, but it took an act of Congress to actually make that happen. Um, and we do both of those things. What that meant, what that has meant, I think, in the grand scheme of things, if you look at 97, the, the main regulatory driver for sustainability in fishing was the rebuilding requirement, this 10-year rebuilding requirement, which you might have heard. If it's overfished, you've got 10 years to rebuild it. There's some uh, exceptions to all of that. That was significantly driving, the, that was the backstop of which we could not go beyond in the early 2000s. And there was a lot of improvement that was made at that time. Now I think as we go further with the ACLs in place, that rebuilding requirement is less and less important. Fisheries are much more driven by the precautionary need to avoid overfishing generated by the ACLs. And we will have less overfished stocks in the future. Those stocks will naturally come off of the overfished list. We will have less stocks subject to overfishing because we are managing through the ACLs. That is, I think, the, the, uh, the transitional shift between the two fundamental ways in which we manage fisheries from 97 to 2007. And we're doing that uh, across all of our fisheries. The other thing that, that was big in 2007 was these uh, catch share programs, and they've been called a bunch of different things, but basically where you give some segment of the fishery something akin to a property right, even though it's not a property right, um, but something akin to a, 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 a license to catch a certain number of fish at a certain time, so that it's, it's individualized. And um, as Margaret said, Congress has had kind of a love-hate relationship with these. It has worked well in many fisheries. It doesn't work so well in other fisheries. Even in 2007, there was a groundswell of support. It, uh, and we have seen, um, since the passage of the 2007 Act, a number of more big fisheries come online. The Pacific ground fish fishery came online. New England, as much maligned as they have been, uh, implemented one of the most progressive and innovative kind of uh, programs, which is not actually a catch share program, but is very similar, um, in, in their sector program to get their act together. Um, so there has been a trend towards better management, more accountability. That has come at a cost, though. All of this has come at a, uh, a cost. We manage 538 stocks. I now have to set in some manner a annual quota for 538 stocks. I didn't have to do that before. Well, that requires some degree of investment in science, some degree of investment in management capability. Um, our budget briefly increased up to uh, almost a billion dollars to account for that in 2000 and is now back to the somewhere close to the $800 million that we were in 95 or 2000. Um, so it's difficult to do all, all the things that we were required to do um, with, uh, without that investment in science. And the administration and Congress have been willing to invest in that, but it requires more. The, the more sophisticated you have these programs, the better you'll be able, be able to manage, but it requires a lot of effort on the regulatory and the science side to support that. And with the declining budgets, we are faced with having to look at how are we going to actually do these jobs? How are we going to monitor these fisheries? How are we going to enforce those requirements in this kind of declining budget situation, in, or lim I should say limited budget situation? Um, and that's, that's a difficult societal thing we have to figure out. How much of those costs are taken by the taxpayer and the government? How much by the fishermen in terms of their own costs? Or are there others? Are there other ways to do this? Or do we sacrifice our monitoring our scientific capability and accept greater uncertainty? Um, so these are, these are challenges that we've had to make. Let me talk a little bit about uh, picking up on the, the New England story, because that's, uh, that's been part of all these other ones. And uh, my, my good friends in New England sometimes do get a, a bad rap about what has happened. And it's true that in the history, they have ex experienced numerous cycles, and I think actually it goes back before 1950, uh, of overfishing, cereal depletion, switching from stocks to stocks um, in their ground fish fisheries. 
Um, they were on track, though, even with all that, they were on track by 2008 to have recovered their ground fish stocks by 2012. Compared to the Canadians, just across the border, who had so severely overfished their stocks that they closed their entire cod fishery 30 years ago, and it's not been reopened since. So as bad as they were, they weren't as bad as their neighbors, uh, and there was hope. In 2008, there was hope. They had made a number of, of cuts, in part driven by the 1997 Act and the courts, and in part now driven by the 2007 Act, to get their act together and made a lot of sacrifices, to change a lot of the way that they're thinking. But what happened was uh, in 2012, and perhaps we'll the, the Gulf of Maine, which is where all the juvenile cod are born, was the warmest it has ever been, and, not, and that's not close. Um, that may have had an impact in terms of how the cod, the juvenile, what we, we lost, we, lo we lost an entire year class of cod. They grew up to a certain point, we thought they were coming, so we thought we were gonna recover, and then they never grew up. Why? We don't know why, but it could well be that their nursing grounds became really, really warm. So we have an issue here where uh, perhaps, for the first time in a long time, we have a crisis in New England that is not wholly the fishermen's fault. Um, and it is a true crisis. Unlike past crises, where we might have um, uh, allowed them to continue to overfish, we cut the cod quota 70%, and that may not have been enough. Last year, 70% reduction in the cod quota. Um, and we uh, have another disaster in which we might give them another 30 million. Um, but, you know, this is, I think, one of the trends in the future, one of the things we're going to have to worry about in the future is traditionally fisheries were thought to be, fisheries, the, the amount of renewal by the fishermen were the main driver. If you cut fishing, the stock would grow. If you allow fishing, the stock would decline. It was a very linear kind of relationship. What we're beginning to see are there are more external drivers out there. Climate change could be a major factor for some fisheries. It could be a boon for others. Um, their uh, pollution, oil spills. You know, what is Deepwater Horizon, gonna, the, the, the oil spill in the Gulf, going to affect in the long term the productivity of some of our stocks down there? Uh, so I think this is a big challenge uh, coming from the future. Um, some of the other challenges that we have in terms of our regulatory approach, and I'm glad that uh, Margaret mentioned it, Recreational fishing. If you, if you heard her list from Bo Bill Hogarth, um, it talked about how, what we're going to do for the commercial fishery. That was all, all of those things were commercial, or many of them were commercial fishery things. The recreational fishery in this country in, rivals the economic value of the commercial fishery on a national scale, and in some areas of the country, particularly the Gulf of Mexico, far exceeds it. The removals for some fisheries in the recreational fishery far exceed the commercial removals. You just don't see it because instead of one boat capturing an awful lot of fish, you've got thousands of individual recreational fishermen catching a few fish, um, but the, the effect is the same. Um, the Magnuson Act was designed as a commercial statute. It works really well regulating the commercial fishery. One of the things we're seeing is that it has difficulties with, with recreational fishery. Right now, the most important recreational fishery in the country may be the red snapper fishery in the Gulf. Red snapper was a, a fishery that had been overfished for years and years and years. We finally got the commercial side in line, and they are behaving uh, well. And the stock is recovering. The stock is recovering far faster than we thought. They're bigger fish. They're more out there. This has been a disaster for the recreational fishery because they're more because you know, the recreational fishery target the fish where they find them, and they're finding a lot more of them, so they're catching a lot more of them, such that in a fishery that is improving far faster than we thought, far greater growth rates, the recreational season went from a year-round fishery to perhaps as low as nine days this year. This system, we have to think about, are we really managing the recreational fisheries in the right way? And I think this is gonna be a big challenge as we move forward because you do have to manage them. You can't just think about it in the same thing. They're not commercial fisheries. You're not dealing with a few boats. You're not dealing with a business. You're dealing with individual private citizens who want rights of access and things like that. 
And we have to think about how to do that. I think the Magnuson Act is flexible to deal with those kind of things, but I think that's a, an issue we're going to have to deal with. The same thing is true with subsistence fisheries. One of the things we saw, there's a Senate draft circling around there that talks a lot about uh, subsistence rights. Well, the Magnuson Act doesn't really talk about that in a great deal right now. But that's an important issue that we have seen, particularly with a lot of these coastal communities in Alaska, in the Northwest, in, in the island territories. And as climate change occurs and some of these communities are being impacted or literally washed away, um, you know, their ability to have subsistence fishing and how that interacts and how that changes is going to be a difficult issue. Um, I do want to talk a, a little bit about uh, seafood. The, the, one of the purposes of the Magnuson Act, if you read it, is to uh, ensure a seafood supply to this country. We know that uh, seafood is one of the healthiest uh, sources of protein you can have. The FDA recommends two seafood meals or two fish meals a week. Um, so I view part of my job is to make sure that we can continue to supply the American people with that food source. Where is that coming from today? 90% of the fish that we eat, we import. Some of that we've ex caught here and exported and we import it back. But 90% is imports. Over half of that is aquaculture products. The domestic fisheries are not as significant a source of fish protein to this country today as aquaculture and all of that is foreign aquaculture. The issue with foreign aquaculture, uh, in addition to whatever quality concerns you may have, is a lot of that is coming from countries with their own growing population. And so what we see now is that issues that were exporters of fish to the U.S. are becoming importers, where they're taking their own products and giving it back to their own country. And so we have people that are concerned about that, grocery stores, restaurants, other folks who are concerned about where they're going to get the fish to sell to the U.S. people um, are concerned about the change in dynamic of our import-export ratio on aquaculture products. We can supply more of that through uh, improvements to our wild capture fisheries, but I doubt as the U.S. population continues to grow, I think the, that the, um, we have to face this issue of how we are, we are going to feed our people fish protein um, in that kind of global dynamic. I want to raise one other uh, issue that I think is going to be uh, uh, big in the future. Um, ecosystem dynamics. Separate and apart from the whole legislative issue on this, the, uh, NOAA has embraced the concept of ecosystem-based management. The councils have largely embraced the concept of ecosystem-based management. You have to, when you are taking action, if you can figure out what you're doing, you have to figure out how it affects the entire ecosystem. And, and you, if you are taking a forage fish, you don't just look at the uh, health of that forage fish and whether that's the same. But you have to figure out what it does to the other trophic levels. If you are dredging a marsh, you don't just look at what it does to the little nematodes in the marsh. You can actually figure out how much fish productivity you lose when you lose that marsh, because we know that there are forage fish there that then grow up into bigger fish that are eaten in there. We've done some really remarkable work on trying to value marsh restoration and other kinds of things like that. Ecosystem, dealing with the ecosystem and the, either the degradation or improvement of the ecosystem from both fishing impacts and other impacts are very important as we go, for, as we go forward. One of the things that concerns me now is we just issued a report with the Fish and Wildlife Service about coastal habitat wetlands loss. The coastal wetlands are the nurseries for many of our ocean fisheries, either for the fish themselves or for the, the, the fish that the fish we catch eat. The rate of coastal wetlands loss has been increasing at the time when around the country the rates of other kinds of wetlands loss is stable. We are losing the productivity driver for our fisheries. That's separate, that maybe some of it may be climate change related, but it is, it is difficult. We need to get a handle on this and to reverse that trend in coastal wetlands loss 
or else we, uh, we will see our oceans become less and less productive and we will be able to get less and less fish protein out of that. I want to close with one final thought, um, which is similar to the final thought uh, that Senator Stevens put up there about the global economy. Fishing is a global business. Despite this import-export ratio, a lot of that fish was caught here and sent out, out somewhere else to process and comes back here. Fishing is a global market. These environmental issues that we can talk about are global issues. One of the things that we want to do is take the management regime that we have here, the emphasis on sustainability, the emphasis on science, the emphasis on profitability at the same time, and export that. I would love it if in the future our main export with all due respect to, to, to the fishermen here, is not necessarily the fish products, but it is our management system to the world. If we could get the rest of the world to follow on some of the similar principles that we have, we will have gone a long way towards solving some of the global problems that we have seen around, around the country with overfishing, with degradation, and indeed with economic destabilization that comes with uh, depleted fisheries. Thank you very much. <laughs>